Okay, so I trust that all of you have used Rhino before. Is there anybody that like did not use Rhino once last semester? No? Okay, that's good. And I know a lot of you use Revit and probably other programs for your modeling, but since um, we are going to be moving into Grasshopper, it's good just to like refresh <coughs> with Rhino. So we're going to start with like a very <coughs> simple thing. The idea is to kind of produce a very simple object rather than a complex one like you guys will be working on next when you're modeling like your corner from floor to ceiling um, to kind of produce the same kind of object. Um, so we're going to make a camera. Yay. <laughs> so if we were working from drawings, um, you can just go over to file and import. I'm sure, do all of you know that you can import a DWG or an Illustrator file into Rhino? And do you guys all know how to do that? Like raise your hand if you don't. It's okay. I didn't know how for a long time. Okay. So you go to import and then uh, find your file. All of my AutoCAD files look like Illustrator files because I do not AutoCAD and AutoCAD is not on my computer. So this is a DWG. So you can find your DWG or an Illustrator file and open it. And it'll ask you these questions just about like how you want to import it. Do you want the model units to be in feet or in millimeters? So you'd probably want to put them um, into millimeters. That would depend on how you set up your file to begin with. So um, for your corners, since you're all working in Imperial, when you first open Rhino, you'll want to make sure your units are in Imperial, and then your drawings that you import from AutoCAD also are in Imperial. So you press OK, and here it is. It's really tiny. Um, but I blew it up so that it's easier for you guys to look at. Yeah, so if you just hold shift and um, do this, that's scaling uniform, or <coughs> you can do scale 1D, so that's just in one dimension. And if you click here, what? Two. Oh yeah, two, that's right. Um, so scale 2D. I don't know if you guys, have you guys used scale 2D? Yeah? Okay, scale 2D is actually pretty sweet. You can do a lot of different manipulations to things in Rhino with scale 2D. So now it's, it's keeping it uniform, but I could, by using scale 2D, I could like scale it up very accurately if I made like a tiny little perfect one millimeter by one millimeter box or and scale it to things. Um, so there, there's scaled 2D. And um, your files will automatically import with all of their layers, so that is really handy. So one of the big things with this um, assignment is gonna be like your layer management, because when you start exploding the objects, um, things can get really messy, and you'll wanna select certain things and not others, and be able to drag them back and forth so that you can get everything in a good view. And um, if you are anything like me, like I'm a messy rhino -er, I model everything on the same layer, and then at the end I kind of panic and start like throwing things around and trying to make layers out of things. Um, it's really not a good way to do things. It makes it really stressful when you're actually trying to like get your information out. Okay, so I trust that everybody that's following along has their camera brought in. So on your drawings you're going to have measurements, but on this one we don't. But a way to get measurements, you can use the distance tool or if you go into drafting, so this is the standard view that you guys are probably used to seeing. Um, if you go into drafting, you can um, click on doo -doo -doo, linear dimension and you can actually dimension things and annotate things in Rhino. And you can change your dim styles in Rhino as well. I just use them for um, building, not really for annotation. Okay, so the first thing we are going to do is um, I kind of just copied this drawing up <coughs> here to not ruin the original drawing. So 
that's one thing you'll want to make sure of when you import your drawings don't just like start building off of them right away like keep a copy because if you delete something accidentally that would suck okay so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna figure out how tall this camera is and then I would just select this guy we'll hide that And what do I have in here? We'll, ex we'll make a planar surface. So if you just type in planar surface on any planar curve, it will generate a surface for you. And then from that surface, we can extrude it to the 4.97 that it is. Pretty ghosted. <coughs> so with this camera and with your drawings, you're gonna have like you have a plan and you have section sections and you're gonna have to kind of like smash those things together to create your three-dimensional object. So um, one way of doing that is just like like I'm taking these so you might have to look back in your drawing packages to find information that might have been missing from your drawings. Um, if there was information missing from your drawings so that you can do like an accurate corner. So if I select these two, like this is that outer ring of the camera, planar surface. Oops. And then I can find out how long that is right here. Extrude the surface. And then we'll want to do the same thing with the other guy. The other surface, more specifically. I often call things guys that are not. So if you're confused, just let me know. Okay, um, so there's our lens. It's very simple. Uh, something that you guys might find handy if you haven't used it before is like, so say you've <coughs> modeled something and then you realize that you actually like you needed some of some geometry that is now like gone. Like say you deleted those curves. Um, dupe edge is like a really handy command. You can select like any edge of a poly or nerve and it'll give it to you. So now I have like a curve here on top of having my poly surface. And if I just make that a planar surface, now I have like that lens that would be that glass thing. All right. So um, I know some of you guys have the Cardinal House. That house, who has the Cardinal House? Okay. Um, so I know there's curves on that one. Does anybody have a really curvy wall? Okay. <coughs> no, you don't have any curves? Okay, well that's good. Yeah. Okay, <coughs> anyways, um, say you did have a curve, there's like a lot of different ways to build them. Um, and I'm sure you, like you guys have gone over all this stuff in Graphics One and you have gone through Studio, so you would have had to figure some of this stuff out. But, uh, so you can build curves by using circles and trimming them. You can build them with sweeping or lofting or you can build them with like arraying. So like in this case 
I'll show you guys how to make this button by Rang. So what I did is I just took the profile and then this is the height, obviously. So if you just flip it up, move it to its intersection. Pardon me? Yep, I just rotated it. Um, now we can polar array or array polar. And you just select the center of your polar rotation. It prompts you, as usual, the number of items that you want to array. So like on the last one, I had done six over here. If you wanted to be really smooth, you would just add more contours, and then you would lose like the facets that are in there. So if I did 10 this time, um, One way, the other way. So now we've arrayed that little profile and we can just select all of them and tell it to loft. Revolve. <coughs> you probably could. Yeah, you could. You just probably have to do it in plan. Um, another way of kind of building more complicated geometry is obviously with curves um, and sweeping. Do you guys know how to sweep? Sweeping is really easy. This is like on top of the, the little camera here in addition to. So, um, you have a profile curve. In space, like I know a couple of you have like the swoopy roof for um, the Comox house, Gilbert house. Um, you can produce like more complex things if you sweep. So what you need is two rails and a what is that called? A bridge? Sure. So if you do sweep two, you're saying I'm sweeping two rails, first rail, second rail, and okay, cross section, not the bridge. So there you go. And they wouldn't have to be the exact same curve. Mm. Are you guys like familiar with lots of these commands? Did you cover this last semester? If we're being redundant, you can just tell us. Or ask us, like, yeah. tell me how to do this, or how would I do that? In previous years, Matt and Jody have given you guys a survey. Like, they've given us surveys and asked us, like, what are we comfortable in? But this year, they didn't really do that, so we don't know. How, where you guys are. Yeah. So if this is all been covered before, just tell us, and we can move on to something so we're not wasting your time. Yep. You guys can get away with just building a box, essentially. Just because if it's slightly bad insulation or rigid insulation, either way, you can just model it as a solid box as if it's filling a void. Yes, yeah, so if you have like, I don't know, some of the details are kind of weird where there's like a big air gap with like a small amount of bats in the wall. I wouldn't yeah. do that. I would well, probably just fill it. Yeah, just model it as a solid. Don't worry about the squiggly line. That's just a symbol. Um, we can, yeah, we can look at that later on. Uh, we are going to be covering some textures and other stuff. Yeah, we will be going over, we'll go over some like basic rendering 
stuff for you guys. Um, this far, are you concerned about hashing and just how to represent it in the assignment? I was, yeah, I was just curious about what the for Any other questions? No? Okay, so I just quickly flipped uh, my little lens there and I'm just gonna make the frame. So the same idea, um, when you guys are modeling like your walls and stuff like that, you'll be able to just select your lines, make them into a planar surface. And the nice thing too is with uh, Rhino, if you have like a curvy plan, it works the same. Like you can just make it into a planar surface and then extrude it up and trim it however you need to. So this is point three three. We'll just model this really quickly so we can get to the uh, the AXO stuff. How many of you have you? Did you guys all have to make exploded AXOs last year in graphics? No. Have any of you made exploded AXOs before? Yes. Okay. That's good. <coughs> all right. So. We pretty much have our camera. We just have to like add a couple of little things. Okay, so Boolean functions, I'm sure you guys all know what they are and how they work, but we'll just go over them really quickly. So this lens obviously is intersecting with this body and when you're making an axonometric drawing, if you haven't booleaned your objects out of each other, then you won't see that like profile line of where something is actually sitting. It'll just like disappear in your make 2D or in your, if you are making 2D, which I would assume you are. Um, so what we'll just do quickly is we'll Boolean difference this poly surface. So now, it's actually like a, s a separate thing and it has like an insert for where that lens would go. And we'll do the same thing with this. And we'll put a button up there. So um, if you're building objects from curves, um, it doesn't want to cap it. What we can do let's see. Usually you can if you boolean different something or you boolean split something <coughs> and your object is no longer in NURB, you can just cap it if you type in, you select like your entire object, whether you're working on studio or graphics or anything, you can select like your entire thing and just press cap and it'll cap all of your open edges. Unless they are like <coughs> non-planar or like overly complicated, like this is not overly complicated, but it's a number of facets and so it doesn't want to cap because it's not understanding all of the little faces, like all of the little edges at the bottom. So like we have this open, poly. So the way that we would deal with this is um, be really annoying. We could loft between a whole bunch, but you can see what it wants to do is like select each edge. So I would suggest like 
duplicating the edges, which is annoying. We'll have to select all of them. But once they're selected, we'll be able to join them all together and make a planar surface and join it with the rest of the poly. Okay, so we have all those edges. You can join all of those curves together. So now it is, oops, just a closed curve. And we can just say make it into a planar surface. And now we can just join it with this guy. So now it's a closed thing. We'll just move it back. And now we can Boolean it, hopefully. No, we can't. Maybe we can split it. I'm sure you guys have um, run into these issues in the past with booleans. Explode it? No. Okay. Whatever, we're going to leave that Boolean alone. Pardon me? Yeah, we could, we could do it then. Yeah, we could do it then. If we took this, this planar, this little edge around the bottom that we, we made that planar surface at the bottom, if we just took that edge and we extruded that, then it would work. But it doesn't want, it, Booleans don't usually like to Boolean with polys. They usually just like to be like a NURB, like a solid thing. Okay, so we have our camera. So let's look at it over here now. So we have um, a lens. We have our two, I don't know, focal lenses, the flash, our button, and our um, screen, and like the little frame around the screen. So if we wanted to put, if we wanted to make this exploded axo, what we're going to want to do is first we will hide all this stuff. Move this guy somewhere we can see him really good. And we have to work in isometric. So what we would do is we go into perspective. Um, it's kind of weird, like when you're in Rhino, if you go to view and you go to set view, it'll give you the isometric um, drop down, but if you just go to like your viewport, okay, it gives it to you as well. I think in the Mac version it doesn't. Anyways, um, so you'll want to select a view. So now we're in parallel, so this is southwest. If you have a lot of things on your page and you go into isometric and you're worried about like screwing up like your view and now like the parallel thing looks weird, you just select your object and do ZSA it'll get rid of like the other stuff that's in the view and um, you can always go back to this. Do you guys know how to save views? No? Okay. So if you want to save a view, say you found a view of like in, inside your building for studio or of this project and you're super happy with it and uh, or even I find it really helpful when you are rendering things to like kind of just like investigate your building or look at everything and save a bunch of views that you think are cool and then you can go back into them and like look at them and decide like which ones you actually want to do. So say we wanted to save this view. Um, doo -doo. You go to set view and we go to named views. And we'll just go to save as. So it's saying save current viewport setting and then you can just name it as whatever you want. So you could say like, oh, this is going to be our render one or like my AXO view. Okay. So that's saved. 
Now if I like navigate around this thing and I do crazy stuff, I can always go back into my set view. I have a named view right here, Axo View 01, and it'll bring me right back to that, that view. So it's kind of like a helpful thing if um, you're rendering something or you're trying to diagram something and you just like shifted this the tiniest little bit and now things don't line up. Like, I don't know if you guys have like rendered and made make 2Ds and you try to overlay the make 2D, but you like moved your camera just like the slightest bit and so now everything is off and you can't get back to it. It's so frustrating. Um, so now you don't have to worry about that. So set view. Axo view. So, um, for thank you. For this project, you guys probably can just stick with um, one of the isometric views, whichever one you want. Um, for some reason, I really like Southwest. It's just my fave, no matter what. Always. <laughs> um, so, the way you do an exploded axo, you can see I've got like all of my different parts on different layers. Um, this is helpful just so that I can like, I don't know, see every part, make sure that everything is like not intersecting, whatever. So you can explode um, in all directions. And if you were trying to reveal like something that was inside a wall, you could also use a solid to kind of like eat away at like say that drywall so you can see whatever is inside the wall if you want in like one chunk. Do you guys know what I mean? Yes? Showing like what those layers are and how like the assembly would like smash together. No, you'll be able to, like. This is what you're going to do. You're going to. Let's see. I want to let me select this. I'll go to shaded. You're going to take the objects like once you've got everything modeled. And like for this, what makes sense is like this thing would go up. This lens would come out the furthest. That is residual and we will delete it. This lens would come out next. Your button would go up. And then your frame on the back here would need to come out and not interfere with your button. Why is it going so slow? It's kind of annoying. Okay. So this is what this is kind of how you do an exploded axo. If you had stuff on the bottom, then you'd explode that stuff down. If there was pieces in between like this thing and your camera, then they would be sitting in between. Um, Matt and Jody wrote on your brief, you don't have to do like screws or nails or anything like that. Like you'll have to do like your wood frame construction, your gypsum um, and your and your bats or whatever in your, in your walls. Yeah. Um, windows you'd want to do like window frames and the glass so like in this case maybe I would have one more blowout from my screen and that would be like that piece of that piece of glass which we can do if we want um, oh it's right here <coughs> Right? So, okay, are you guys all familiar with um, making 2D in Rhino? Okay, it, it can be a bit of um, an issue sometimes. It kind of sometimes will give you like really small curves and like can be kind of messy. But in this case with what you're doing, as long as you've Boolean things out of like your main, like your objects that are intersecting, like you will get detail. 
So I'll show you a couple of tricks that I find handy in um, right now, why is this taking so long? I feel like it's this thing. Okay, we're gonna make 2D. So this is really handy to have everything on its own layer so that when you make 2D, you can select things on the different layers in Illustrator. Do you guys know that when you make 2D and you export to Illustrator, everything comes out on its own layer, if you have them on their own layer? Yes, okay. I didn't know that for like all of foundation. And I would sit there like clicking every little tiny curve and then move it to a layer in Illustrator to change the line weight. It was so brutal. I wish that somebody had told me. Okay, so we're gonna make 2D. This is all good. All right. So a quick trick in um, making an AXO. If you guys have looked at AXOs, and I know Matt and Jody are gonna put some examples up on the D2L, I think. Um, all axos have like an outside line that is heavier than all of the inside detail lines, meaning that anything that is touching air is heavier. Is this one example? No? Okay. So a really easy way of doing that in Rhino is if you have everything selected and you patch it, go by boundary, and if you actually click outside of your boundary, it will hatch everything. And this seems like a weird thing to do, but now if I go cell hatch and I move this onto its own layer, let's just make it white or gray. Now when I go into Illustrator, I can just select that layer, reverse the hatch to a line, and change it to whatever weight I want, and everything will be outlined like perfectly. So if you want, we can just quickly do that. So exporting, if this is my ex exploded AXO, the other thing you can do if you wanted is you could, um, you could draw so in an exploded axo, you usually draw all of like your lines between things to show like how they connect together. And they're usually dashed. But um, you can do that in Illustrator. So if I export selected, We'll just scale it in Illustrator, because it doesn't matter. Okay. Do you guys have any questions about like the making 2D or exporting anything like that? Okay. So um, the next thing that we could probably do is if you just go back a whole bunch of times, we could set up like a basic um, render file. Are you guys all pretty comfortable in V-Ray and like doing basic rendering? No? Okay. So um, if we go to V-Ray and we go to options, sorry, I'm gonna just turn, I'm just gonna delete this so that we can start from scratch. Okay, so um, sending up like a basic render file, like it for sure can be tricky, um, especially if you've never used like a manual camera before. If you know how a manual camera works, like V-Ray is exactly the same. So if you go into your options, um, 
you have camera, the, the important ones, I'm sure that they went over this with you guys, but I'll just tell you anyways. Um, to me, the really important ones are the camera, the environment, the F VFB channels, the output, indirect illumination, um, and that's pretty much it. There's like not that many. So I usually go to my environment first, and um, yours will probably, if you have the default settings, it'll this M right here will just be gray. So if you click on it, what you want to set this little drop down to is text sky, and that's just telling um, your Rhino that like there is a sky in the world. So let's use it. At least that's what I think in my mind. Um, when you go to the VFB channels, this is um, important if you want to do like a lot of Photoshopping. So I always have it on RGB color. All you have to do is like click on them. RGB color, alpha, and um, these are only really useful if you're exporting as JPEGs, if you're exporting as PNGs so that you can like do other stuff. Um, so if you're exporting as a JPEG and you want to do some crazy stuff, choose Z depth and choose background. Actually, don't do that. We'd have to show you how to use HDRIs to do that. Do you, does anybody know how to use HDRIs yet? No? Okay, we'll save that for another tutorial. Um, Output, so you know you can type in whatever you want or select one of these, but what you really want to make sure you do is um, select the Im like the viewport ratio. So if I select the 600 or 800 by 600 and I get view aspect, you can see that like the view is actually a little bit different. Um, and I just will always lock that so that, like you know sometimes when you're rendering and like it is not what you're seeing on your screen, I'm sure you get. I'm sure some of you have run into that, and it's just because you don't have the view aspect. Okay, and then um, indirect illumination. I'm sure you all know. Turn on your ambient occlusion. What it does is um, objects that are closer together. There's like more shading between them, so it makes them look more real. Okay, so that is good. know what that was about um, so that is set we'll go back into the camera in a second next the thing that we want to do is we would want to set a Sun so this is what I always do is I turn manual control off and um, I don't know if you guys have ever used this before but so the Sun Sun angle calculator you can actually put in like the closest you can get to Calgary is Edmonton to get like the really natural, like a really real light. But um, I actually usually leave it in Ghana. I don't know. Maybe because I like it, I don't know, whatever. Um, and then you can change the time of day. So this is the time of day. You can see like my little sun meter is um, going. And when you turn the manual control on like this, it, like it'll actually track the day. So like if you go to do a render late at night, it'll tell you like it is 11 p.m. and it'll put your little cursor thing it'll show up like way out here and you will have no light so you have to actually kind of like like I'm like it's 9 59 a.m. but I kind of like I like the Sun between like 2 and 3 I think is a kind of nice time and then just place your Sun and just so you guys know, it does not matter where your sun is in Rhino. It doesn't matter if it's like way below the seaplane or like way above your building, whatever. It doesn't matter. What matters is like the angle of the sun. So right now you can see like it's on this angle, meaning that like it's coming in this direction. So if I go here and I say view rendered. Mm, you can see like the sun is coming in this direction okay a couple of little tips about your sun is you guys may have noticed um, the sun will make like really hard shadows and sometimes it will be really blue or really yellow so if you select your sun and you go into properties 
Um, you go to the object. Oh, hey, there we go. So um, now you can see you can modify your sun. So the size of my sun is super tiny. It's one, and that's why we have really hard shadows sometimes in Rhino, like where like the shadow literally looks like a black outline, and it's really hard. If you make your sun big, like between 30 and 50, you'll get really soft shadows. Like so, you'll get that really nice gradient that you would get like in the middle of the day. And your turbidity actually changes how blue or how yellow your sun is, as well as the time of day. Like more so the time of day, but that is what turbidity is. Okay, so now our sun is like pretty big. We have a, a text sky and um, we have our camera. So what I did is I went ahead and I put some materials on my camera and you can do that as well. You just select the sky and you go into V-Ray and you go to your material editor. And I just loaded up like basic materials that I have taken off of um, Flying Architecture. Have you guys all, are you all familiar with Flying Architecture? No? Okay, so if you make an account, it's free but you just have to like give them your email address pretty much. You can download like all of their materials and it's pretty sweet. Some of them are um, really good. Oops. So obviously I just go to materials, that's all I go to. Um, every once in a while they also have like free HDRIs um, if you don't know what an HDRI is or you don't know how to use it yet, just so you know, they will come in very handy. And if you find free ones, you should get them. Um, so you can see here, like these are materials that cost money, but you can, if you have an account, you can download most of them free. They used to all be free. Like when we were in foundation, they were all free. So these are materials and you can download them. And then you can edit them as well. So like this one, it was a blue porcelain and I just changed it to black. So the way that you bring in a material, I can just delete all of these really quickly. Do you guys want me to do this? Do you want me to do like bringing in materials and mapping them? Okay. We will just remove these. And we'll start from scratch. Okay. So you can see I have just like my plain camera basic materials. So when you're applying materials, you can apply materials by layer or by selection. So you can see how having like your layers organized would be really useful. You can say like everything that is wood. I can select by the layer and apply the material to that entire layer instead of having to like sit there and select like every little piece of like whatever. Same with anything. So um, I'm just going to go shaded quickly so I can see my layers. Okay, so my camera. Just select this object. Um, I usually apply things by selection. But you shouldn't. Um, so if you go to, well, we can do it by layer, okay. We go to V-Ray, and we go to our material editor. This is what pops up, and there's nothing there because we haven't loaded or created any materials. You can right click on scene material, and you can see you can create a material, you can load a material, you can load a material collection. I've never done that. I usually just stick to these two. So creating material, is really easy. You can start by going to standard. And if you click on preview, you'll see it is like the default material. To the right, we have like a whole bunch of different um, kind of effects that we can apply on this material. So like the color, the transparency. Um, does, does everybody have ma like V-Ray materials downloaded like from stuff or is there people that like do not have any V-Ray materials? 
Okay, so we'll just make a material really quickly and then we'll load some. Um, so if you double click on color, you can choose a color from any of these or you can just make your own color by simply twisting this guy around and then moving your little eyedropper guy around. But in this case, I'm gonna make our camera. So I'm gonna make it black. So if I go preview now, you can see my material is black. And um, for the transparency, let's just see, sometimes I forget what this does. Yeah, so it makes it more transparent. We don't want that. We do want it to be shiny. There we go. So to make it shiny, we have to go to reflection. Pardon me? So if you just right click on the on the material and you go to create layer. Oh, right here. Uh, no, those are, all of this stuff in here is kind of, I think it's telling you about like how it's going to render it, like trace reflections, reflect on backside, only in secondary, like I would just leave those things as there default. Nope. I think, yeah, like you probably saw when I updated this no, as, okay. yeah, I just added that layer. Yeah. So by adding this layer, you could probably see when I pressed preview on here, it suddenly kind of came shiny. So we can do this if you want. We can just um, delete this layer if I can. No? So if I remove the layer, I go to preview. You can see there's like there's no reflection. Again, if I right click on default and I go create layer, and I go to reflection, now it's shiny. And if you want to do emissive, emissive is really cool as well. It makes um, your material glow, so it's like a like a light. But you can change the color of it, and you can change the saturation saturation up saturation. That's going to be edited out. <laughs> Um, okay, so we've made our material. Uh, let's just call it shiny black. And you just do that by double clicking. So now um, if I right click on my material, I can apply this material by selection or by layer. So if I click apply material to layer, what I want to see here is just, so my camera is on layer four. So apply material to layer. And then here you can see all of my layers show up and you could, s I don't think you can select multiple layers at once. I've tried that before and it really didn't like it, but it might have just been because it was heavy. Um, but I would just do it like layer by layer. So if I say, okay, now that is on that layer. Rendered. There it is. Okay. If we go back into material editor, I want to editor. <laughs> I want to make my lenses like a metal material and the frame on the back a metal material. So um, I'm just going to load this one up. So if I right click and I go to load material, this is my material library. They're all viz mats. And I'm just going to choose this metal nickel hairline. So that pops up in here. Yes? 
No, you don't. You, yeah, like when you go to load them up, like for the first time, it'll like basically ask you to browse. And then from then on, it's like I just made a folder called like my V-Ray materials or whatever. It just always loads up into that same folder. Like it knows where to go after the first time. Yeah. Try and dump all your materials into the same folder just so it's easy. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, it, it's fine. Yeah. You're all good. It can be in your downloads or wherever. So um, here you can see my material. Again, I can um, apply the material by selection or by layer. I'm just going to apply this one by selection. So if I just select this guy and this guy and this one, and I go back into my material editor, I can just right click and say apply material. Oops, I did layer my material to the selection. Okay, so that looks pretty good. The last thing I want to do is just put glass on this and make this button red. So I'll just select this first, material editor, um, right click, I'm going to load this material. Glass is pretty easy to make because it's just the transparency that I was showing you before, but if you have a basic glass, um, I use this one a lot, it's art glass, but it's like really green for some reason. So if you want to change the color of a material, um, this one, the color isn't in here, like it's not actually in the material, it's in the fog. So if you just click on here, you can change that and what I do is I usually just like bring it over like closer to the white like so it's like way less green and then if you just preview it it just looks a little bit better so apply the material to the selection now I've got my button the last thing I'm going to do is um, oops. I'm going to load like a shiny material. So I have a couple of different porcelains. I'll just open one of them and just change the color of it. So this is porcelain pure white apparently. Yep. So you can see it's got like a, a shiny thing going on and we will just change the color right here. We'll make it red. There we go. And we'll just apply that to our button. Hey. All right. So now our camera has its materials and um, we've set an environment and our sun. So um, the last thing that we want is like, so if you have set an environment and your sun, it's usually because you're after the shadows. And if you're after the shadows, you need to have um, like an infinite plane or a surface underneath your object to actually see those shadows. If you're not after the shadows and you want to just like create them in Photoshop, then you d like you don't have to put the plane down and you won't get like a background or whatever. Um, in this case, I'll just do the infinite plane. So let's just render it and see. Oh, we didn't do the camera. Oops. So I played with my camera settings last night, so uh, we can just quickly go over those. Hmm. Maybe your infinite plane it turns everything black. No. It's not above your objects, is it? <laughs> is it? No, it's usually like a default. Did you go through each and every computer 
settings? No, I haven't. So I'm just going to close this quickly for you guys because I realized that um, under the V-Ray options, I didn't show you like the camera stuff. So last night, um, I just kind of set this up really quickly. So when you open your camera, it'll probably look something more like this, where your physical camera is off. And what you want to do is you'll want to turn your physical camera on. And um, you can override your focal length if you want. Like you can make a fisheye view, if, but all it's going to do is like basically like zoom you out and like pull the edges. Um, so you want to be careful. Like I don't usually go below like 15, and 15 is kind of pushing it. 15 you can get away with if like like it will just not be pulling the edges of your geometry and really distorting it. Um, so you can override your focal length there if you want to. We're not going to. Um, and then here you have uh, kind of like the basics of like a manual camera. So it's a still camera, you have a shutter speed, you have an F number, and an ISO. So if you don't know, a shutter speed is the amount of time that the shutter on your camera is open and taking like light and information into the camera. So the longer that is open, the more light you're going to get in your picture. So the more likely your picture will be blasted the longer it's open. And the higher the number of your shutter speed is faster. So it closes faster. Does that make sense? Um, so if I change this down to 125, then I would get a brighter image than at 600 because 600 is faster. Yes. Uh, I'd say you, like usually between like a thousand and like 80. Something important to note here: when you guys are rendering, if your image isn't coming out the way you want it to, don't go in and change like three different things. Just change one. You won't know what's wrong if you're changing like six variables at a time. You just change one thing, if it gets better or worse, then you know whether you're changing it in the right direction or the wrong direction. Is that fair? So, and it takes longer, but okay, it's before faster in the long term. Yeah. Before I tell you, or we talk about the F number, we'll just talk about film speed because it seems like people get really confused with ISO. And a basic principle to ISO is like, the darker it is, the higher the ISO, the lighter it is, the lower the ISO. So if you're taking a picture outside um, or outside of your building, um, you will probably want to have a lower ISO. If you are taking, or do, taking renders inside of your building, you are probably going to want to have a higher ISO. And when I say a higher ISO, I mean like, like up to 3,000. So generally, like, if you were shooting a camera during the day outside, your ISO would probably be between, like, 100 and 400. So those are kind of, like, safe areas to be for your film speed. And if you're inside, you're usually looking at between, like, I don't know, 800 and, like, 1650. And then depending on, like, how dark the space is, higher. And then uh, the F number obviously is pretty straightforward. The lower it is, the brighter your image will be, the higher it is, the darker it will be, and it can be used just to balance both the film speed and the shutter speed. Um, in V-Ray, for some reason, I find the F number is like very, very finicky. I will often like leave it, or I will only go like down by like two stops. So like, like, five, like as low as 5.6. And other than that, like I don't really touch it. I usually just play with my film speed and my shutter speed, and I, f I find that way easier. Which is strange because on a manual camera, like I would not change those. I would only change my f-stop. But whatever. So um, here I put in 600 into our shutter speed. F number is eight, and our film speed is 100 because we are like outside of our object, and we've set up an environment. So, did you figure out your infinite plane? Yeah. So if you render your camera or any object that you have um, been modeling or whatever, it should look somewhat like this. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, sure. So um, while this renders, we can go into Illustrator and just open that file that I exported earlier. So it's called Camera Axo. And it's really small, apparently. I don't even know where it is. I hate it when that happens. Oh, here it is. It's not really small. It's just to the side. So I don't know if you guys have um, like experienced this yet with uh, Illustrator, where like your objects if they're not close to like the zero zero point on the seaplane, if they're like off in like wherever in Rhino, they will be off in wherever in Illustrator. Like you actually need to like bring those things back down to zero zero so that you can see them when you get into Illustrator. Otherwise, sometimes they like fall off the drawing plane and you can't like bring them back into into Illustrator. It's really weird, but there's some import options too. Oh, is there? Okay. Okay, so here is our camera. We'll just make our um, our artboard a little bit bigger for our exploded axo. Oops, did not mean to do that. Okay, so you can see here um, that my illustrator is really tiny, right? Maybe it doesn't look as tiny on up there, but it's so tiny. Okay, so I have all of my Make 2D layers um, right down here, and then I have my hatch. And what I was kind of saying earlier is like we have this hatch, we want to select the whole thing and invert this. Make it black. And probably make it like two in this case. And then all this other stuff. We will also make black. Before you do that, actually, do mm -hmm. you guys know about the select similar function in Illustrator? Some of you do. Does anybody not know about it? Okay, this is like life changing. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, do you guys yeah. have it set up as a hotkey? Okay, if you do have your computers open and you have Illustrator open, you should do this, and if you don't, Open up Illustrator after this is uploaded on YouTube and do this, because it'll save you so much time. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I know select, but I don't have it as hotkey. Okay, well, we'll set it up as a hotkey then. Okay. Uh, so if you just undo the layers so that they're all different. So what Kaylee's got here is a bunch of layers, uh, and they've all come in as different colors, right? So that's one uh, aspect of those lines that's different. You could also have different line weights coming in to Illustrator or different fills. So you have fill stroke and line weight, or I guess stroke. Same. Or line but color. Uh, what the select similar function does is if you select one object in an Illustrator, say one line, say the green line here, and it's got a stroke weight of one, one. point and it's got this very specific color of green. What the select uh, similar, oh, yeah. Oops. It's not letting me go there. There we go. Same. Kay. Same. Uh, so what you can do is select everything that is the same fill color, fill and stroke, uh, stroke color, opacity. You got all these options here. What you're gonna probably want is, I think I have, fill and stroke yeah. set up. So if you click fill and stroke, what it will do is now she has each line on the page that is green, green and, and one, one point. point. So this is huge if you just want to select all of one type and make it a different line weight. Say she wants these to be like 0.5. Now I have them, I can make them 0.5 and black. Okay. But, so if you want to set up a hotkey for this, uh, if you just go up into this file. Edit. Yeah, down here. Okay, so edit preferences. Just 
general, whatever we give it. Um, where is it now? I think it's under user it's interface. interface. Window actions. Okay, we'll try it that way. Whoa, this is weird. Okay, so you have a limited option here for Yeah, you can set it to Okay. So I mean choose whichever one you want, I guess, for this case. If you do it this way, I guess you'll have a function key. Um, if you do go into the preferences and change it that way, you can set it to any key you want. It's uh, like mine is uh, control function S, I believe, or yeah, control function S. Uh, and it's way. weird that you would record it as an action. If it works, it works. Yeah. Anyways, you should <laughs> you should do this because it will save you a ton of time over the next two and a half years. Um, so this is one way. Do you guys want to see the other way as well, or? Okay. Oh. okay so I guess you record it. So you would select, okay. What is the options box? Do I? It's recording. Okay. So you'd select your thing, and then you would select same fill and stroke, and then that would be your action. So now we have. Mm, action one and that's what it would do so anytime you would want to use that I guess you would just select your line and then you would just press play on your action is it set to the yes. so now I have all of those lines or if I if it was a different what you set it to F one. Oh, I said it shift F1, right? So if I did this, shift F4. Yeah. Okay. So that's one way you can do it. Actions, actions exist in Photoshop Drop as and well. Yeah. Is it different than layers? Layers? Yeah, this is um, an actions bar. So you can record like a series of procedures that you want to have at hand that you use a, like very often and then when you open a new file you can just start by selecting maybe the one thing and then you play the action whether it's hot keyed or if you play it from the action bar then it'll like go through that procedure of steps that you've recorded it's like an autoplay so like a really common thing is if you're if you're importing a bunch of say site photos that you guys have collected for your project into Photoshop, you can do the same thing. When you say you want them all to look the same, you can just record your action as, let's say you're gonna desaturate it and add a vignette around it. And then you save it as don't a do new that. file. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> but say that's, that's your process for getting site images. If you save that action, what you can do is just open up the next picture, press play, and then it'll do all those steps for you. And then you can just do that for each image. Or so you can batch them. Right. Where you don't that's even do that. That's not good. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, and that's. Yeah, so we just recorded that action and we set. Um, I set Shift F4 as the hotkey for that action. So anytime I select like one line, say I'm like, I just want to select all those red lines and they're so tiny and I can't see them, I can just now press Shift F4. And now all of those red lines. Yeah. Okay. So we'll we'll show you how to do it in the preferences now too, if we can remember how. So it was edit, right? You only do it once, so it's kind of hard to remember. Preferences. 
Is there interface? Sure, let's try that one. I was looking at this the other day and I found it so it's, uh, Which is what? Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, more over. I'm moving my mouse, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's going on. The wind is bogging oh. me down. Yeah, it is. Okay, so here's what our render looks like. Does everybody's render look kind of like that? Everybody that followed along? We'll go back to the, il the Illustrator in just one second. I just want to close this so that my computer stops, like, dying. Did anybody have trouble with rendering people that tried it? Or did you find it, like, fairly easy? Yeah? Mm-hmm. I only use, um, like, point lights and lights, like, in, like, a building. Um, and I probably, well, it depends, like... <laughs> it's faster in Photoshop. Yeah, it's a lot faster in Photoshop just to, like, if you're outside of the building to just, like, select that window or whatever and brighten it, or if you're inside to just brighten it, like get like a like a medium good render and then just manipulate it in in Photoshop because lights um, they really bog your rhino down like it's a lot of information for it to process and it can be like they can look really awesome it just like takes forever. it takes forever and because of like the ray casting and everything off of all of your materials it'll like yeah it just can be a nightmare you can, like, if you want help with it at one point, feel free to ask us. We can yeah. do We've that one of them. We have <laughs> jumped off that diving board before. Um, okay. <coughs> Any other questions um, about rendering? So if you wanted to save just this one, you would click this save one. Um, say on your VFB channels, like I showed you earlier, where you have, like, the alpha, the background, the ZDAP, like, all that stuff. Um, you'd click on save all images right here and um, you would probably you'd want to set those things to uh, JPEGs but generally speaking you'd probably just set this as um, a PNG and just save like the one image for this no you'd have to not have the plane. Yeah. So, um, like, what I'll usually do is uh, just select everything. Like, this would be very easy to select in Photoshop, and I would just make this black and white, like, the ground back black and white. Yeah. Or, like, you can just delete everything around that shadow and then, like, move the shadow onto its own layer and play with it. But, yeah. Okay. Let's just close this. We'll just save it and close it. Okay. Later. So now we are in Illustrator. What were we doing? We're going to edit. And this is for select same. Yeah. So if you scroll down. I'm not going to wait on there. Do you know it's not working? I don't know. I didn't change them. Click on the Or search? No. Oh, yeah. Just do search. Again. Select. Or is it same? Selection's B. No. I think you're in the it might be. Mm -hmm. so scroll down. Select. Oh, 
other select? It doesn't matter. <laughs> oh. We showed you one way. Well, he showed us one well, way. Well, I'll set up another video of this all on its own and upload it to YouTube later just so we don't waste time. Anymore. But yeah. There okay. will be a YouTube video for that, and please do it. It'll, it's like so worth it. What else do you need to cover? Um, so the only thing that we would need to do beyond these things um, is we probably just want to make everything black. Okay, computer. And you want to just make like your dash lines that show how this thing goes back together or how it came apart. So it's pretty self-explanatory. You would have like a line going from this opening. to this lens, and then uh, this lens to this one, and they would be dashed, and they would be very light line weight. And then the same thing, you would have lines coming down here to show that that's how it came together. And then this would have lines coming back onto your camera, and then same with this. And then you would want to annotate that. So on your drawings, I don't know what it's going on with this, but... <laughs> um, on your drawings, like you're gonna have these corners that are gonna have like a lot of different parts. And so we, what you'll wanna do, like in the same way that you annotated, you have all your information from your, from your drawings. Um, so you'll just wanna like call those things out again on your, on your axos so that we know like this is a cedar thing or this is brick or whatever. Does anybody have any questions? 